Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. And my guest today is Natasha Smart Textiles. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Irina. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure. So I stumbled on your Instagram account first. And I have a friend who does wet felting. And she does the flat scarves kind of things. And she was showing yeah. me the process. And it's very physically intense process, like to felt to wet felt something. You create 3D um, models, basically, with them. There are baskets, there are bags, all kinds yeah. of things. Was that this like a gradual process? Like, did you start with something flat and rectangular, like the rest of the universe? <laughs> Oh, yeah, totally. Probably some really small, you know, A4 size sample. I'm sure that would be how I would, how I would have started as well. Um, I think that's kind of how everybody starts, actually. And they use probably merino wool roving or tops, which is, is the sort of standard that I think everybody starts with in wet felting, um, you know, because it's a really good felting fibre. Um, it took me, I think, quite a long time to realise that there was such a big world of wet felting out there, actually. You know, there's different types of fiber, you know, there's, um, you know, bat fiber, which is where it's sort of in big long sheets, which is actually primarily what I use now. Um, well, I, I don't think I even knew it existed, you know, for the first year, few years, even that I was felting. It's, I think, like any kind of art or craft, once you delve into it, you know, you start in this tiny little small wormhole. And once you go in, you then realize there's this enormous world of wet felting. So, um, so yeah, so I started, I'm trying to think what the first thing I ever made was. I'd done a, um, a college course. I did a foundation course in textiles, which was a part-time course. Uh, and so we did all sorts of different textile things, you know, weaving, machine knitting, screen printing, dyeing fabrics and felting. And I knew that felting was the thing that I was really going to be, be interested in. So I think that's where I first made felt. And we just made actually little samples for our sort of uh, kind of scrapbooks, you know. Um, so yeah, different so So that's definitely how I started. Uh, yeah. So I mean, you went from like just taking a course and like playing with it in your free time to starting a business part time to now taking a plunge and doing it full time and full -time, teaching yeah. and how, like how long was that process <laughs> it's a 15 16 year overnight success you know um yeah it just I, I think these things grow I kind of you know I was just interested in it so I did a I was really lucky that I could go part-time in my job um to do this course because it was two days a week um and I was really lucky that I was able to to do it uh, for a year um but I didn't have any particular sort of intent with it all. I think I just, I've always been a very creative person and I kind of just wanted to, to do something more creative in life, you know. So I just imagined, I think, when I started that I would just do this course and, you know, it would be fun and then I'd see, see where, it, where it took me. I, I didn't really have an intention. Um, but I think kind of over time I started to, um, do more at home I then started to run workshops um, I also quite early on started writing um, magazine how-to project articles and that was something I got into and I think just over time slowly I've kind of done more and more um, and and yeah it, it just I, I almost never actually imagined that there would come a time when I would be able to do it full time, because it's really difficult. You'll probably, you've spoken to so many people who work in arts and crafts and it's hard making a, a full-time mortgage paying living, you know, doing that sort of work. Um, and I, I suppose, although I'd talked about it, you know, for years of thinking, oh yeah, that's kind of the ideal one day. I never really thought I'd get there. And then uh, just last year, things kind of all started happening and and yeah and I was able to do it, it so it's as much of a surprise to me actually I think as to anybody else do you remember that like that day when you decided this is it this is time for me to go full force and do it full time full time um well actually I I can remember because it was only last year so it was due in obviously COVID and the pandemic and everything and um 
I think what happened because I'd been doing more and more posting more and more videos of workshops and different things and things I was making on Instagram and I'd started a YouTube channel and um, my videos I think on TikTok got picked up by a company who primarily post on Facebook um, they're the sort of um, people I think it's called ultimate and they are often pulling together these interesting videos you know it will be like um oh I don't know man creates um a swimming pool in his garden out of pallets over a weekend <laughs> and it will be this video of somebody doing some kind of just really interesting kind of crazy thing um I think I saw one the other day which was all about um uh, this technique to get earwax out of people's ears and they were showing uh, you know these pieces of earwax being pulled out you know so it's that kind of you know those random sort of videos right. that just pop up on your feed, uh, Facebook feed without you actually sort of um, you know necessarily following following a page it was one of those anyway so they'd contacted me because they'd seen my videos on TikTok of me using the felting ball which is um, a way of creating 3D felt so that's moving on from obviously the flat rectangular piece right. and creating structure with with your fiber so it's basically having a form that you can um, i'm going to show you i thought i'd have one here ready so this is a, this is the felting ball that i use um so by putting the fiber around the ball you're then you, you know and then felting it you're then creating uh, sort of 3d hollow shapes and forms so they'd seen these videos and obviously thought oh that would make quite a good you know maybe that was more interesting than earwax i don't know <laughs> um and uh and so they pulled together a sort of an amalgamated video of um of loads of clips so that came out i didn't even know it had come out and so my phone just started kind of exploding with um, people contacting me on Facebook um, and all over the place um, because they put this video out and it just sort of went viral. And I think in the end, it was something like 1.2 million views um. of this video on Facebook of <laughs> basically women, may, yes, women bouncing the ball and making felt you know bouncing the ball in tights because that how, that's how I do it pantyhose you know tight um and it just it just sort of took off and I was just so busy it all suddenly exploded um you know with people I've got an online course so and um, people I'm signing up to the course people contacting me about workshops uh people wanting to buy felt bags and yeah it just it just went mad and so um I was earning more money per month from that. I had a part-time job at the time, um, three days a week, and I was earning more money from my felting textile work right. than I was in my job. And I thought, hang on a minute, you know, my husband and I had always had this agreement actually that if I could earn the same salary every month um, from my textile work as I did in my part-time job, then I might as well, you know, that would be the time when I could go full time. And so I kind of did a bit of a tot up of some figures uh, and showed it to him. And he kind of went, oh, oh, yes, oh, you have, haven't you? So it was a bit of a no brainer, really. I think I was ending up being so frazzled trying to work my job as well as, right. you know, trying to do all the textile stuff as well. So, uh, you know, something kind of had to give. I mean, and it was just, yeah, an amazing sort of opportunity that I hadn't really anticipated but it was primarily down to this video going going viral um I think so do you remember like your first instructions like when you taught your first class and how does it compare to like when you're coming into the workshop now well I would say I mean obviously quite different um I think at the beginning See, at the beginning, I hadn't learned the felting on a ball technique, actually. So you can make 3D items using a flat resist to shape things as well. Um, I find using the ball more effective way of doing it now. But at the beginning, for the first, well, probably five or six years that I was felting, I'd never even touched a, like a 3D form as a resist. I was only using flat ones. So... Um, so I think what I'm actually teaching now is obviously very different um, because I'm very much focusing on, on using the felting ball. 
because it's so it's fun you know there's a kind of fun aspect of bouncing a ball isn't there you know uh, that, that that kind of comes into it all but I think you know I know so much more about felting now it's you know there is nothing like having experience and just making 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 things and a whole variety of things as well because um, I didn't start out making bags I started out probably making jewellery and small items and then so so what I've made over time has sort of shifted as well um, mm -hmm. so, and I think there's definitely a kind of a, a confidence thing when I mean I find it a lot with with people who come on my workshops often they've never felt it before so they don't think to themselves I think I'll just go and make a small sample somewhere that'll be my first experience of wet felting you know they see the bags and think right I'm going for it you know because it's quite an ambitious make um it's a long day you know we, we need eight hours probably you know of, of teaching a small group of four people well um, I mean, you, make, you make all sorts of things like I saw yeah. you just posted this video of you making this very artistic elaborate hat <laughs> But then there is also like bags and baskets and even like I saw your cat sleeping in one of the baskets, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cat bed. Um, was that part of the growing up in the business as well, like deciding what you're going to make, what you're going to concentrate on? Yeah, well, I think because um, I used to make all sorts of different things and and when um so we had a bit of a life change back in 2015. So we'd lived um, in Surrey, sort of around London. My husband and I both worked in London. So we were commuting in and we had a bit of a life change because his job changed and he started working from home. And then we realized in theory, well, actually we could work anywhere, couldn't we? Um, and we'd always wanted to live by, by the seaside. I mean, who, you know, who doesn't? Right. Um, and we, I've got a cousin who, who lives here down in Devon um, in the same town as us. And, um, and so we'd been visiting. So we don't, you, you know, you have these kind of dreams, don't you? Oh, wouldn't it be lovely to, you know, and you look in estate agents windows whenever you go on holiday, don't you? Looking at prices of houses and things. Um, and we just suddenly thought, well, actually, we could do that. You know, you always think in life about why you shouldn't do things, don't you? But actually, once you sort of think, well, yes, I can. You can. You can do it if you want to, you know. Um, and so we did it. I mean, sometimes I think back and think I, I can't quite believe that we did. But um, yeah, so we moved um, down to the south coast of England in Devon um, back in 2015. So that's um, oh, six and a half years ago now. So, um, so that that sort of gave, you know, quite a different kind of opportunity I mean it looks like you're living your dream right now because you moved to the place by the sea you're working full-time at the thing that you love is there a new dream like is there something that you can think might happen in the future I don't think so I think this is all actually still quite new for me I haven't quite settled into being a full-time artist maker um even the saying the word artist feels a bit weird um you know it's sort of it, it, everybody has that kind of those uh, you know i'm not worthy sort of moments you know um but, but you know it's a sort of artist teacher uh, is is what i am um yeah i think it's it's still too new actually i'm not quite um settled into you know doing this full time yet so it's still it's still very new and I'm still kind of a bit wide eyed about it and and trying not to spend all my days faffing around, which is very easy for me to do. Um, but, you know, to try and be a bit more focused. Um, well, I've heard um, that you're working on a book that's supposed to come out pretty soon, actually. Yeah, yeah. That was another just lucky break that, that happened. I have a bit of a policy of trying to say yes to things. Um, and uh, I was in conversation. Um, there's a lady I'd actually mentioned to you, uh, to you by email. There's a lady called Linda Miller, who is an amazing embroidery, machine embroidery artist. And I've been a fan of hers for many years. And she'd written a book many years ago, actually. Um, and 
I was having a bit of an email conversation with her because um, she's done a few commissions for me. Um, I, I had a big birthday in uh, 2020 and she did a, a commission piece for me. And in the course of those emails, um, she mentioned that she was writing another book. And I said, just in a throwaway kind of way, oh, I, you know, I'd love to write a book. You know, that's, that's something I'd always, you know, fancied doing. And she said, oh, I'll mention you to my editor. Um, and I didn't think anything of it. Anyway, the editor contacted me and, and there we go. So that was me writing a book. Um, so that was right at the start of um, kind of the whole lockdown. Do you believe really, like, you know, there is this whole theory that like if you send your wishes to the universe, universe <laughs> listening, like do you believe in that now? <laughs> I, I kind of think it makes it sound like I'm really lucky, doesn't it? Um, I'm not, not sure that's always the case, but I think there's maybe something there about being true to yourself and kind of following your own path because um, you know, what I do is a very niche sort of thing. Wet felting in itself, you know, as an art craft form is very niche. And I'm focusing on using the felting ball, which is a further niche, you know, going down into, into all of that. Um, and I think, um, but, you know, I've just done what's interested me and, you know, doing things like, um, you know, putting things out on social media or, or YouTube, um, you know, Although they were, you know, they're quite difficult things to get started on, aren't they, when you're putting yourself out there. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I've tried to just post things that were true to me, that I felt were interesting and a bit fun. That's kind of been my, my sort of policy, just trying to share, you know, fun things. So um, somehow just by being true to what your passion is and what you're interested in and not trying to do things because you think that... Um, I don't know that it will make you money or that other people would be more interested if you do a certain thing. I've just been doing the things that I've been interested in, but trying to share it with people. Right. Um, I saw you I think... also like when you when you create those uh, bags or those baskets, like some of them you just do felting, but then on some of them you use like very unusual material. So what's unusual in my mind, basically. So there is like certain... Uh, you do embroidery with like fuzzy yarn that doesn't felt and you put the crocheted pieces to decorate the felting bags. Like how was that process? Like how was that whole discovery happening? Um, I think it's only by doing more and more. The more you make and the more you play and the more you experiment, um, you know, that's, that's where all of this comes from. It's really hard when you're sort of doing things as a business because um, every time I make a bag, I'm really conscious that I want it to look really good in the end and be right. And I would, you know, then be able to sell it, for instance. And that really discourages the sort of playing and experimenting, I have to say. So, right. you know, um, it's a bit of a killer for that. Um, so that's why you have to make a lot of things and keep playing and be open to things. I mean, you know, you mentioned my crazy hat that I made, um, which is here. <laughs> I'll put it on for you if you like, but- um, it's, Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> it's, it's a very, it's quite a tall hat. <laughs> As I said, it's not something that I think I'm gonna be popping to the shops in. Although funnily enough, I wrote that on the, uh, on the post that I'd I'd put up with it, and people were saying to me, "You must wear it, wear it." I'd wear it everywhere. People are saying, you know. <laughs> so um, that's it's actually so lovely. I don't know. Like I, I would totally wear it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's quite flamboyant. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm a firm believer. You know, I'm a I'm a teacher, a tutor myself, but I'm a firm believer in in you know. Um, in learning, you know, you've got to keep on, on learning and pushing yourself. I know that, uh, as I've said, that there's this massive world of wet felting. You know, I think this is only the second hat I've ever made, you know. So I've made a lot of bags, but, you know, there are other people who have absolutely focused on hats and are brilliant at making hats and have fully explored that. I mean, it's almost like it's a lifetime's work, just focusing on, on one narrow niche of making in, in a way. So I do think it's it's really important. You know, I don't know everything about felting. I, I know quite a lot, but, you know, there are lots of things that I don't know about. Um, so you've got to keep kind of learning and pushing your own boundaries, I think, and playing with different materials. 
I mean, the different materials is just an excuse to go shopping. And (laughs) there's always parcels coming, you know, constantly. Um, Well, you showed me your stash of uh, materials. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That like looks like a warehouse and some big box store, basically, with like all kinds of colors and and, uh, materials there. What's that journey like? I mean, how supportive your husband of that part of your career? (laughs) Well, it's sort of when it starts taking over the house. um, There was a time not very long ago when there were these big, you know, those kind of big shop up um, shopper bags with the zip that people travel with. Um, I mean, uh, maybe six of those. So uh, in addition to what I've got in the studio, but, you know, like six of those, they were in the living room. Um, in the spare room I've got a spare room which is sort of my upstairs working room office and I've got a sewing machine up there Um, so I was taking over the whole house so I do try and tidy up and you know (laughs) but the problem is that I think I'm paranoid that because if I run out of fiber or you run out of a particular color you know I'm in trouble because that's my core material that I work with so and of course it's quite bulky Perhaps if I vacuum packed it all, that might help if I kind of that would that would reduce it. But um, yeah, I mean, there's no no avoiding having a lot of stuff. So, yeah, he's very patient um, with with all of that. And then now and again, I try and have a bit of a tidy up or hide things so that he can't see them. (laughs) Do you have like favorite colors that you always gravitate to yourself? Um, It's funny, actually, because I do a lot of. I seem to just be continually working with pink and purple at the moment. I don't know. It's almost like you sort of get into a bit of a, a, you know, a bit of a theme. Um, I would say it's all bright colours. I mean, I wear, I do wear a lot of um, pink and green myself, but I never wear blue, for instance. Blue looks terrible on me. And, but I work with blue quite a lot um, as well. So I would say it's all quite bright colours but I never, never do anything with black. I don't wear black. I don't work with black. Um, so it, it's all about bright colors, I think, for me. Have there ever been like a felting disaster in your studio where you like done something and it was just horrible in your view? <laughs> um, yes. I mean, often what happens is it's really, I mean, I shouldn't complain about how long it makes to ba- make a bag. I can make a bag in a day. And I know if you're a knitter, you can't make a jumper or a shawl right. in a day, you know. So you're thinking, gosh, you can make up something in a day, you know, lucky you. But um, as you say, it is quite physical. And um, the thing about working with the ball, um, uh, the felting ball, is that uh, we work in reverse. So all of the decoration is on the inside. Mm. Then I put the wool fiber on and that kind of protects everything um, whilst you're bouncing it and, and, and all of that. Um, so often you have you go through the part of the process and you've forgotten what the thing even looks like because it's all hidden. So for several hours, and sometimes I do them over a couple of days as well. So you come back to it and and it's almost like when I take the um, the felting ball out of the of the felt shape, it's almost like that kind of, oh, please, please let it be good, uh, you know. But I have had disasters where I, I did this one bag once where I'd, um, I'd used sort of beiges on the outside, so the main wool, the wool fibre colour, but I'd created an inside layer of a bright yellow. And I thought, well, that'll look nice, the yellow with the, um, you know, to brighten up the sort of beige colours. And honestly, this thing, when it was finished, it was like the colour of sort of, a partly rotten banana um, <laughs> and it was just so oh, dirty mustard I mean I hated it so that got chucked in the in the in the pile um, of uh, I have got a black bag which was hidden in one of my cupboards upstairs full of the things which I hate but I still can't bear to actually throw them away so well, is so there all there. To, right is there a way to like somehow reuse them or do something with them <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You could either cut them up. Once once felt has been well felted, it's not like you can kind of bring it back to um, right. a sort of wool fibre stage, stage and yeah. reuse it. But you could cut it up and use it as a piece of fabric, you know. Um, or, you know, the other thing is, you know, sort of hand or machine embroidering on top or doing, doing some kind of <laughs> covering surface technique. Right. So, yeah, these things might all come out again at... at at one point but I don't throw 
even a scrap of felt that I make I don't throw any of it away so I've got bags of stuff <laughs> this isn't helping my hoarding problem <laughs> well is there like is there a problem for you personally like of when to stop like when you put this decoration and that decoration and like this layer and that layer like do you have hard time stopping yourself from continuing for like days instead of like saying this is a bag I'm trying to sell let's stop at six hours yeah yeah a, a little bit and over time um my kind of oh, signature if you like um design that I've been using has been wool yarns I look, use a lot of boucle yarn just because I love the the texture the little loops that you get it all adds to the sort of pattern um and mohair um sort of straight mohair as well they're really good felters because they're hairy so they they um bond with the wool fiber really well um so I've always used yarns that's very much been my thing and I think I started off where you know I might use five or five or six and you'd, you'd see very much see the individual strands around well now of course I'm getting to the point where and if you can see with this one um you know there are so many yarns on there um so it's definitely I've I've become more is more over time um where now I'm just layering and layering I mean as well as other there's other sorts of um uh, silk fibers and other fibers you can put on as well so um yeah I'm I'm going towards more is more and yeah it takes quite a long time I mean the actual layout you know you can spend quite a long time mucking around with that well, when you have so. your when you have your students with you are you ever surprised at their choices and like at what their final product look like yeah and I think I try not to um, sort of impose too much of my design choices on them because I found actually that everything everyone makes is beautiful. Um, they all turn out lovely. Uh, I think um, even when, you know, sometimes people will pick such an eclectic mix of colours of the yarns to use on their bags, um, you know, and you might look at that and think, hmm, it's, you know, you've gone through the whole color palette there really you know it's not subtle at all but I encourage them not to be subtle um because I think you do need you need to go a bit brighter than you think you want to with wet felting because what happens is that the wool fiber that you use behind it so if you use a blue wool fiber on top of all those different colored yarns for instance the blue um actually bonds with all of those those different yarns and it kind of has the effect of dulling down the colors a little bit, but it also kind of gives a consistency to the whole design and a sort of uniformity. Everything has kind of got this halo of blue around it, for instance. Um, and that actually just makes everything, it makes everything work. So I kind of think there aren't really any, any rules with, with wet felting, just the, the process of everything blending together in a sort of, you know, it's an imprecise way. It's very kind of fluid and organic is the result that you get. Um, but that kind of is all rather nice actually. So I think, I, generally I'm always really impressed by, by what people do. And often they, um, they'll lay out their yarns in quite a different way to, the, to how I would naturally do it. So it's great seeing what other people do. I, I really feel like I learn quite a lot from you know the the students who come and make their their bags too there's always something new um new to do right and on my online course for instance um so in on the inside of the bag there's a pocket uh so we have a there's a closed facebook group and participants share photos of of bags that they've made and one of the ladies made an outside pocket which looked fantastic and i thought i'd never even thought to do that you know even though i taught them how to make a pocket but she'd right. actually thought, oh, OK, I'm going to put that on the outside of the bag, not the inside, you know, which is a great idea. So there's always things to learn from each other. You know, it's um, and I learn a lot from other people, too. So I kind of I think that's why I enjoy teaching so much, actually. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, always something that new that comes up. So is Instagram the same way for you? Like, do you find sources of inspiration there and some new ideas? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I follow quite a mix of people. So other wet felters, but some needle felters, people who make pottery, knitters, crocheters. So, you know, quite a mix. Um, quite a lot of um, shell collectors as well. I'm quite interested in shells and shelling and uh, 
so all of that um you know it's it's all kind of opening up your eyes isn't it i think to different sort of creative uh, avenues and possibilities and um even sometimes there's quite a few my husband and i really enjoy going to florida on holiday if we can get there it's been a long time but um uh, so i follow a couple of people who post pictures and videos about um florida and just things like and, and hawaii and you know the sunsets and so sometimes there'll be like a so, sort of sunset color you know a sort of a very uh, unusual sort of color combination because of the light and you can and i think to myself oh that would make a nice bag so <laughs> well, things, remember, like, things like that do you remember the first time you had that idea like looking at nature and thinking it's going to make beautiful felting i don't think i don't remember it as a as a first first time if you know what I mean I think I've always used it a bit um because in the things that I make I'm not generally making sort of very representative pictures right. it's much more about organic lines but they're kind of they sort of give an impression of um landscapes and seascapes that sort of thing um so I think I've always been interested in I mean I started collecting shells when I was I was very little you know and had my first collection and I think I've always been interested in the beach and the seaside and shells and um and I, so I think that somewhere you know you don't quite know where these influences necessarily come from do you but no. I think it's just something I've always been interested in so I think there is a sort of bit of an organic slightly landscapey seascapey look to, to quite a lot of what I make um, well you mentioned that you follow some of the needle felters have you ever tried combining wet felting with needle felting because I saw like one artist that she does this like village scenes basically like of the homes and like little children playing and what have you on the wet felted bags like have you ever experimented with something like that I haven't really um needle felting is great if you want to create a very precise sort of design which you can't get nearly as easily in in wet felting um but yeah there are amazing people who sort of they might create a wet felted background and then needle felt a design on right. top um so some amazing stuff but i think because um because i like the organicness um i'm not sort of needle felting isn't really something actually that appeals to me I mean it, it, it's funny because you know you might call somebody a felter but actually are they a needle felter or a wet felter it's very very different even though they're using the same materials um I mainly use needle felting to repair holes <laughs> so if I've you know got something or something isn't um maybe adhering if it isn't felting together properly if you give it a bit of a needle felt that just gives it a bit of a helping hand and then you can carry on wet felting the only thing is that the only felting boy at ball I've ever destroyed was because I had a bag <laughs> and rather stupidly, you know, what's going to, you know, what I'm going to say here. And I think there was something that wasn't quite adhering. So it was still on the ball at the time. And I loosened it in the area, gave it a little needle felt and managed to um, oh, stab God. a hole in the ball. So that one died. So, but, but that's the only casualty that I've had, but um, yeah. So I don't think needle felting just, yeah, it's completely different and isn't quite for me, I think. Right. Well, you started the YouTube channel and on your YouTube channel, you posted a few tutorials of how to do certain things. Do you think like a person who never felt it before can stumble on your YouTube channel and make it with you like for the first time ever? Well, that's my hope that someone could do it. And I mean, I have had some quite nice feedback from people um you know about the tutorial saying oh yeah this is, this is really clear I got this that's really gonna gonna help me um I don't know whether people are you know are brand new to it but I hope I mean that's I mean you'll have seen I'm I'm quite thorough everything I do takes ages and is long and I can't do anything quickly you know <laughs> everything has gone down to the you know the nth degree and um so the tutorials are very much standalone you know that somebody could go and and uh, you know, get the equipment they need uh, and, and give it a go, I think. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think whether I have, I think I, I perhaps have had some feedback from people who've, who've had a go and, and said, uh, said, yeah, you know, I, you know I've, I've done this, this is great, thank you, so. Well, what's your ambition for your YouTube channel? 
yeah I don't know because all the tutorials on there are quite long um and kind of getting longer as I <laughs> clearly <laughs> just go on more and more um I, it's almost like what I need to do I think is try and do some quicker shorter things uh which I've always done sort of on Instagram reels and on TikTok for instance really like little clips mm -hmm. um but I'm kind of I've got the idea of perhaps doing you know a day in the life of a workshop you know and just a bit of a roundup of a, of a workshop say making bags you know that's maybe only a five or ten minute video you know maybe that would would be something different so yeah so I don't quite know I don't exactly know where it's going I think with a lot of the things I do I, I don't really know where the end you know where I'm going to end up it's just trying to just enjoy and have fun with with the journey really Right. Well, but if you've got any advice, <laughs> I, I mean, to me, it's the same thing. I'm sort of figuring out things as I go along and um, I'm, I'm no professional by no means, but I know that I really enjoy this journey, you know, and I enjoy yeah, yeah. meeting new people and getting to know them and realizing how much we all have in common, regardless of what kind of fiber arts we do ourselves. Yeah, definitely. I think... Um, yeah, it would be, I think, I think for me, maybe to do just some shorter videos or maybe some sort of tips, you know, things that maybe only last five minutes. I really enjoy long YouTube videos because I'm in my studio, you know, making a bag for six or seven hours. So actually having long things to listen to and watch, I really enjoy. But then there are other people who perhaps only really want five or 10 minutes, you know. So I don't know, maybe trying to do, for me, to do a, a bit more to appeal sort of to both might be a good thing right. if I get around to it <laughs> well I honestly love watching you on on uh, Instagram doing your thing and you seem like you really enjoy all aspects of it teaching and doing it yourself and being you and I'm so happy that I got to meet you there you know and uh, that you agreed to be a guest of my channel oh well thank you for getting in touch you know it's really nice I you know I feel like I've learned a lot by finding your channel and then you know listening to all sorts of different people um you know talking about their creative lives so I've really enjoyed that too so uh, mutual benefit there <laughs> thank you so much for being a guest on my channel oh, well thank you for having me